Yes, yes. Uh, this is me right here as a 22-year-old. And these are my buddies. They were on the same ship as I was, USS Dixie, which was a tender that uh, repaired destroyers. I was on the USS Blue at the time of, uh, at the time of Pearl Harbor. I'll pass this around. Mr. Ross is the one on the left. I was on, I was on this ship right here at the time of uh, Pearl Harbor. This is a destroyer. And she weighs 1,500 tons. And she has four or five inch, uh, five, uh, four or five inch, uh, 38 anti aircraft guns. She had 16 torpedo tubes on her. The torpedo, they had eight on each side. And when they were, when they were to be sh fired, they were trained out uh, over the side of the ship and then, then fired. Um, we had depth charges for. You know, for submarines, if uh, we were being attacked by any submarine, we could drop depth charges on them. And uh, it was, uh, we had a crew of about 200, 200 men, which was small, you know, compared to battleships and other, other ships. But we were like family, you know. We, uh, well, we, 200 men, we knew one another, and we went ashore with one another. We had a few drinks with one another. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, uh, we were buddies, in other words. Uh, I, first, I'm going to start out by thanking you for allowing me to be here with you this morning. My name is Gerald Ross. I was born and raised in Whitehall. I graduated from Whitehall High School in June of 1940. I enlisted in the United States Navy in August of 1940. I had been in the Navy for about a year and four months and was at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. 1941. As you know, Pearl Harbor is on the island of Oahu, which is in the Hawaiian chain. Anybody ever been to Hawaii? You ever been up? You gotta go. <laughs> uh, get out there and uh, uh, they have a memorial now uh, for the Arizona, which was destroyed at Pearl Harbor. And uh, it would be nice to, you know, to, to go out and visit, go aboard, see the the different things. I'll show you a movie, and you know they have uh, of the attack. Uh, I, I just told you I was on the blue. It was about 200 men. Uh, let's uh, let's find that, Mr. Ross, on the map. I I photocopied this map so you got to see the position of the ships that were in the harbor in that morning. Uh, I'm uh, the blue. The blue was right here. Often uh, IEA, what we call IEA landing. I used to go over there and play baseball. And, with, that's where we were tied up that morning. We were all alone. Uh, Put your finger on the blue. Can you find the USS Blue there? Can you? Oh, up on the top there? You know, I want you guys to find the USS Arizona because Mr. Ross is mm. going to tell you about that too. I was, uh, I spent I spent quite a bit of time in the Hawaiian Islands. So, you know, I was, uh, I got to be acquainted with all these ships <coughs> because we used to go ashore over in Hawaii, over in uh, Waikiki Beach and in those places and run around before the war, you know, we, we were allowed to go on Liberty. And uh, when, when we'd come back off in Liberty, which probably was about 10 o'clock at night, uh, the, uh, all the ships were out in the harbor, the Arizona, the West Virginia, the Tennessee, the Maryland, the, uh, the Nevada, uh, you know, California, the Oklahoma, all these ships, ships were out here in the harbor, see? What kind of ships were those? Those are battleships, but I was just, those are mostly battleships. Right. And your ship was what kind but of? I was, I was a destroyer, a small, we were a smaller ship. But anyway, we were all in the harbor, and we, 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 we had um, motor launchers take us in to shore to go on liberty. We'd pile out with our little white suits on and our hats and take off and go over you know, have a little fun, and, uh, and then we come back, and uh, all of the motor launches would be coming in to bring us back to our ships, different ships, and they'd, they'd all holler, uh, they'd holler out, USS Blue, and the crew of the Blue would get out in the launch and go back to your ship. That's that's the way we did it, anyway. And uh, I think, uh, I say uh, that uh, because the Blue was a small ship, that probably saved my life because the Japanese concentrated on those battleships. 
that was their that was their big thing was to destroy those what was going to probably destroy them later on you know and uh, so they destroyed uh, you know uh, the Arizona and the uh, Oklahoma and tipped her over and the Nevada she she got hit and uh, the California and Tennessee these are all big battleships and what the Japanese did. They, they sent about 300 planes in there. And uh, it's just like, if you want to think about it, it's just like us sitting here now and having 300 planes come and tear Hudson Falls apart. That's, that's just about what it was like, you know. Um, I, was, I was standing on deck uh, waiting to go to a church service because it was Sunday morning. And uh, I'm just standing in and talking with this friend of mine and I heard, I heard the planes come over. I didn't know what they were. And, uh, so first thing I know I saw the USS Utah roll right over. And the, this guy that was with me, he had more time in the service than I had. He said, those are Japanese planes. <laughs> Jesus, we had a, well out, out in Hawaii uh, in the, to get out of the heat we had a canvas over the, the stern of the ship. We used to sit there on Sunday morning and read newspapers, and we would, Sunday was our day to relax, you know. And the first thing you do is try to get that, try to get that awning down so that we could. It was over number four, five inch, and we wanted to use that. So things were, things were happening. <laughs> so anyway, while I'm helping to take that down, Chief Gunner's mate, he's he's coming and running and trying to get into into the magazine so we can get some ammunition going. You know, we were caught flat-footed. Everything was locked up. Ammunition. <laughs> it was a. It was really a mess. You know, that we didn't have any any kind of a warning that the Japanese <coughs> were coming. And that I could never understand that. You know, because the Japanese were making inroads. They were. They were. They. Uh, they were. Uh, they took over like Manchuria, and they went. You know, they went into China. They went into Malaysia. They went into Borneo, Singapore. And, and I mean, if, with all these things happening, wouldn't you think that we ought to keep our heads, you know, look around and see if maybe we might be next? That didn't happen. That didn't, that didn't happen. And that, that's the thing that I, I regret today, that our commanders, we, uh, we had an Admiral Kimmel, and we had a, a general who was in charge of the island by the name of Short, General Short. And they were getting their orders from Washington, right? Well, who's the one? I don't know. I told this day, I don't know who was to blame. Somebody was to blame for 2,000 men losing their life. And, uh, you yeah. it's sad <coughs> that, you know, but this is complacency, right? It's going to happen in your life. You're going to be, you're young. I was young, just like you were. You are now. I was young. I played football up in Whitehall. I was a, I was a pole vaulter. I was a hurdler. Uh, I was just like you guys. Just like, and you're going to be just like me someday with all this gray. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you're lucky. If you're lucky. If you take care of yourself. Don't smoke cigarettes and don't drink alcohol. Amen. Amen. But anyway, uh, let's see what else I can tell you. Uh, anyway, we we uh, we were lucky enough to get out of the harbor. Um, the Japanese planes were were uh, you know they were attacking the battleships, and maybe they didn't concentrate on us enough. But I, uh, the, as I was telling you, the, the chief gunner's mate wanted to get our our five-inch anti-aircraft guns moving, so he was so he was opening up the magazines. So he said to me, I was helping with the awning. He said to me, Roth, come on down to number three magazine. And um, because, you know, what I didn't tell you before was that two-thirds of the ship was allowed to go over for liberty, for a weekend liberty. You know, there's another thing. The way the Japanese were acting, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that the commander would say, well, two-thirds of the ship can go over and have some fun. You know, so there was only one-third of us left on the ship. Did they have, like, a weekend pass? Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, if, uh, if you were... A, like a chief or a first class or a second class petty officer, you were allowed to uh, you were allowed to go over for the weekend, you know. 
and uh, I left the ships unmanned. Was it uh, like thousands of men we're talking about? Yes. Oh, well, yes. There were thousands of men ashore. Um, as a matter of fact, now the, sh the blue here, on that ship ordinarily you would have a, a, a lieutenant commander mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a captain of that ship. He was allowed to go. The executive officer was allowed to go. The gunnery officer was allowed to go. That, we had one, we had, uh, we had four ensigns, which is the lowest part of the, uh, of the officer group, four ensigns aboard the, our ship. And uh, we had, we had a, a young ensign there by the name of Asher. His name was Asher, he was from Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And he was in command of the ship. He'd never been in command of that ship before because, uh, uh, because of the if the captain was aboard, he was naturally he was in command. But he was the captain wasn't there, so you gotta put an you gotta put an ensign in charge of that ship. But we were fortunate enough to have a uh, chief petty officer, which is uh, the new navigation. So he he more or less helped help this uh, young ensign to get us moving, get us out of the harbor. And uh, uh, I was down below deck. You know, like I just told you, I was in the magazine. I was, I was feeding uh, shells and powder to this <coughs> gun up above, and I was the only one down there in that because we were short of it. I was the only one down there. But I, I had a hoist. We had electric hoist. And what you do, you put a powder in, set it up. You'd have a, a shell. These shells probably weighed about 80 pounds, but I was young then. I could lift, put them in. Up, they go. Our guns were, our five inch. As a matter of fact. Uh, the ensign, uh, ensign Asher. One of the things he said after the after the battle was over was that the thing that he remembered was that how quick our guns started to fire. So that was, you know, that sounded pretty good. So uh, we go out of the harbor looking for the, and we joined. Uh, there was another cruiser out there, the St. Louis, and then another one, the Detroit, and two or three other destroyers. We joined them. And there was Japanese submarines outside the harbor waiting for us to come out. So we had sonar gear, and we, we, we sounded out of, uh, uh, a few of the submarines. We dropped depth charges on those. We got credit for sinking two, two, uh, two submarines. But anyway, for 36 hours, we went looking for that Japanese fleet. This small group of, of US vessels, I, there were probably about six of us, these two cruisers and, and the three or four destroyers. Now, what did the Japanese have as far as? The Japanese, when they came into Pearl Harbor, they, uh, they had six aircraft carriers, two battleships, four cruisers, ten destroyers, and uh, what, can you imagine? Can you imagine six aircraft carriers with uh, with uh, all those planes on them? And they got within 200 miles of Pearl Harbor, and nobody detected them coming in. So we were sleeping. Some, which, that's a terrible thing to say, but we just I was just sitting, standing there, waiting, to go, waiting for a motor launch to take me to a bigger ship for, to go to mass, go to church. No inkling. No inkling whatsoever that, that, that this fleet was coming there to blow us off the face of the earth. Did, uh, like when your ship was moving, Mr. Ross, and blew out of the harbor, you see the uh, entrance to the channel here, I'm looking at the map. Yeah. Uh, I assume the Japanese were still actively right. attacking at that time right. when they were moving. Right. And uh, probably went by a lot of these ships that had. Oh, been. yeah. You see, uh, uh, I did not. I did not see that because I was down in the magazine. Right. You know, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see that. But uh, they wrote. They later later uh, wrote a history of the. Uh, I don't know if I gave you that or not. Of the uh, uh, what happened top side. Okay. But anyway, uh, I think uh, the the point is that uh, complacency. Oh no, the, you know the Japanese have never attacked us. You know. They're, murdering people in China and Manchuria and Borneo, slaughtering women and children. And here we are sitting there half asleep. 
they were pretty uh, vicious. Yeah. And uh, you know that leads me to another question that I had. You know, after you said you went out and you were looking for the Japanese fleet, thank God you didn't find it. For 36 them. hours we looked for the Japanese fleet. Uh, they, they were out there 36 hours looking for them, and uh, like I said, I was, I was glad we didn't find them because with, the, with what they had, six carriers and two battleships and four cruisers and all these destroyers, we made sure the work of it. But we came back into, we came back into Pearl the following night, uh, 36 hours later, and the harbor is black. The only thing, the only light there was uh, there was fires on the ships that were still burning. And we, uh, they, had, they sent this commander out to bring us in because our, our young, our young uh, naval officer Asher was not acquainted, you know, with coming in to the harbor, at, you know, especially, uh, at, especially because it was pitch dark. But anyway, then, uh, well, it was, a, it was a terrible mess. You can imagine, you can imagine. These ships blown, blown apart, you know, in the Arizona and, and the Oklahoma and the West Virginia and these big battleships. And, the, and the, the Pennsylvania was in dry dock along with the Casson and the Downs, which was two, but the Pennsylvania was a cruiser, heavy cruiser. And the two battleships, or two destroyers, the Casson and the Downs were blown to bits. It was, we were sitting there like sitting ducks, you know, and here's, here's men, can you, if you can visualize men struggling to get out of those ships, and, you know, and here they, you know, a lot of them were sleeping because they, they had to the day off. Uh, it was a horrible thing. Well, why, why did Japan do it in the first place? Anybody have any ideas why Japan attacked us in the first place? You know why? Do you know why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor? Well, they attacked Pearl Harbor because they wanted raw materials to feed their war machine, and we were complaining about it. The United States was complaining to the Japanese ambassadors, of, and we were going. We were going to uh, apply sanctions on the Japanese. And they didn't like that. Well, I hope I hope if anybody uh, applies uh, applies sanctions to any of you, you don't go shoot them like they did. But anyway, uh, that was it. That's why they uh, uh, that's why the Japanese attacked. In other words, you're not the United States is not going to tie our hands. We're <coughs> we're taking over all these countries like China, Manchuria. Borneo, Singapore, and all these, we're taking them over and nobody's going to stop us. Well, we weren't prepared to stop them. We weren't prepared to stop them because we were not ready. You want to be ready, you know, because, you know, you're, you people are young, you're going through life, you're, you're, every, not everything is going to be smooth sailing. Don't ever forget it. You're going you're gonna to have to keep your eyes open, too, on what's going on around you. It's just the Japanese, that's just a case. I'm lucky, I'm standing. 2,000 2, men are not. So, did you uh, have any friends that you lost? That was kind of a stupid question. No, my, uh, my, my ship was not, my ship thankfully was not hit. And uh, uh, so we did, we did not lose any, we did not lose any uh, Shipmates. But I just I told you the way we used to go ashore that all all of these sailors were coming into Pearl Harbor and uh, into the landing, going ashore. These were all these were just like you fellows. We were all friends. You know, you're, you're coming in. You're going to go over, have a good time over in Honolulu, even though you don't really know one another personally. They're part of. You know what I mean? There are people that are in the Navy with you, just like these, you're all in high school together. It's the same thing. They, you know, uh, later on, my ship was hit in the bar, a Battle of Guadalcanal. But luckily, I was not on it. I, uh, I was on, 
the blue, the blue after. I don't want to. I don't want to get away from Pearl Harbor. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know how much they want to listen to, but no, I'd like to hear um, <coughs> Pearl Harbor. We know it brought the United States into war, and it was yeah. deathly attacked by the Emperor of Japan on uh, right. the United States of America, right. mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a lot of men died that yeah. day. And uh, but you know, life goes on, and the war was on now, and you went on to serve what six years, right? Yeah. So. I kind of like to, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your service in the Pacific and kind of wrap things up with, uh, you know, what happened in Tokyo Bay. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, in February of 1942, we gathered together the ships that we had that weren't, that weren't just, you know, damaged. And we decided we we're going to hit the Japanese islands and the Marshall, the Marshall and Gilbert Islands. I don't know if you know where the, where the Marshall and Gilbert are. I have a map right here. Just to show uh, yeah. people. United States of America, Empire of Japan, 1941. <coughs> There's the Hawaiian Islands. Look how far out they are. But this, this is where the U.S. Pacific Fleet was. Yeah, this is where this is where we are right here. So we, we've got a force together. we got a force together, and we're, we're going to... We're going to hit the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, which is right here. We're going to strike back at the Japanese. By that time, the Japanese control, <laughs> as he, Mr. Ross is saying, the interior where they got coal and iron, mm -hmm. they uh, basically raped the eastern seaboard of China. Then they had Southeast Asia where they got mm -hmm. oil, rice, tin, uh, rubber, and he mentioned Borneo, mm -hmm. and their objective was here. That's well, what they want. They wanted to take Australia. First, they had to take New Guinea. But anyway, uh, this is what I was on right here. Uh, the Blue and the Enterprise, which was a, was, which was a fortunate, fortunately, our, our aircraft carriers were not in Pearl Harbor. Fortunately. How many we, did we have? Well, we had, the, we had the Enterprise and the Yorktown and the Lexington. Uh, not to get away from it, but did anybody see uh, NBC News last night? Or no? Did you see the big thing about the Yorktown? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Wow. So. What did no, you see? Watching it, I the Yorktown was sunk in the Battle of Guadalcanal. Did you see the... Uh, and they found it. It was three miles down. That's what was on TV? Yeah. I think it was uh, Midway, wasn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. It was Midway. It was, it was Midway. It was but it's three miles underwater. They just located yeah. it, and yesterday they broadcast film from taken from a robotic camera of the USS Yorktown down in its watery grave. Yeah. And uh, but that was one of the carriers that was at Pearl. Harbor. Well, actually, yeah, right. Well, it wasn't in Pearl Harbor, but they it were was, out to sea. Right? It was out to sea, right? They were out to sea, right? So anyway, we uh, we've got our force together. It's a small force, uh, uh, the Blue and three or four other destroyers, and the USS uh, Chester, and the, and the USS Enterprise, which was a carrier, and uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to hit the Japanese in the Marshall and Gilbert Islands right here. So naturally, if we come straight across, we're going to be detected. So we go down around Samoa. And we came back up underneath them like this. And we caught them without, you know, they, we caught them flat-footed like they caught us at Pearl Harbor. That was but, yeah, the but, Battle of Guadalcanal you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the first strike in February of 1942. This is the first, this is the first strike back at the Japanese okay. after Pearl Harbor. Right. And it, it's, not a, it's not a big strike. But, it, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that will teach the Japanese that, uh, we might, you know, we're not, we might be down, but we're not out. In other words. Well, it was, uh, so we hit them about 4 o'clock in the morning. We, we, we let the planes off the Enterprise. And we get, and we get the uh, Woji there. There's about two, or, two or three islands up. Uh, and we talk. But uh, it was in the Marshall in the Marshall group anyway. So one thing, you know, you guys are all young, 
But you have to think about about these pilots, these young pilots taking off in that carrier and striking that, you know, striking those islands. Thank God for the for the educated man. Those, if you ever going, if you guys are pilot, going to be pilots someday, maybe some of you will. You've got to give these guys credit. They they went in there and they. They dropped their bombs and they strafed and they did everything they had to do to, to destroy what the Japanese had on those islands. A lot of them didn't make it back. You know, a lot of them didn't make. You know, they, you know the Japanese were shooting anti-aircraft fire at them as soon as they found out, you know, that they were coming in. There. So anyway, uh, it was a good strike. It was a good strike, but it was not a big strike. So we came back into Pearl after the strike. And something that uh, I always felt good about on both sides, on both sides of Pearl Harbor, people were military people were lined up, cheering us back back into Pearl because we had because we had struck them. You know what I mean? We we had retaliated to a certain extent, and it was it was a, it was a good feel. You know. It, 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 uh, it was a long trip. I think I think we were out there. I don't know. Over a month, I think the whole the whole trip down and back it was over a month. We were at sea, and you know when you're at sea, sometimes the sea is not gentle. I don't know if any anybody ever been out on the ocean there. And the, well, I have. I've been seasick a few times. So anyway, uh, uh, after that. We come into Pearl, and we had, uh, I don't know, five or six days to rest up. So they let us go over to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel there and sleep overnight. And they fed us pretty good because we'd come back off in that strike. The next strike we go to is Wake Island. Well, then I, we're going to hit Wake Island. Now here's a... Uh, Albert, right here. There is Wake Island right there. Anybody ever hear of Wake Island? Well, Wake Island was a, was a United States uh, island. Uh, we own that island. And the Japanese uh, took it over. They, they drove our forces off in Wake. So we, we, uh, we decided to make a strike back at them. So we did. And uh, it was the same kind of a strike as the Marshall and Gilbert. You know, we had probably about the same number. It was the Enterprise. It was still the carrier uh, that, that carried the planes. And we were, uh, as a destroyer, as a destroyer, we, we uh, in case a plane should crash, get going off together, it was, our, it was our job to pick them up, you know, pick up the pilot if we could. And, uh, one one did one did crash. Uh, of course, this is four o'clock in the morning, and uh, we we picked up the pilot, and he had lost one eye. Um, you know, probably hurt himself when he, when he, you know, when he crashed. And uh, see, uh, all these young men, all these beautiful young men, they're, they're educated. They've been they've been to West Point, they've been to they've been to Annapolis, and they're. And they're defending, they're defending the United States. And they're just like you guys playing football. It's the same thing. You know, they're out there, and they're doing their job. And uh, a lot of them, a lot of them, not, not only got killed, but they got, you know, they got injured. I always gave those naval pilots all the credit in the world because anybody could take off a carrier at four o'clock in the morning. To strike an island, and not knowing where we were going to be when they when it was all over, they had to find the carrier and land back on it. You know, you got to give them a lot of credit. Take some guts, huh? Take some guts. But anyway, I, I, it's going to take a long time for all this. <laughs> get me get me to uh, Tokyo Bay. But anyway, uh, I uh, after after Wake Island, then we hit Marcus Island, which is another island over here. Uh, these are Japanese held on. So anyway, I got a break. Uh, when we came in off of Marcus Island, they decided to send me to school for five weeks in San Diego. 
So uh, I went to school. I left the blue, and I went to school, and I came back to Pearl to Pearl to, to get back onto the blue. And as I'm coming into Pearl Harbor, she's going out. I'm on a transport, and she's going out. And that was when that was when uh, she got hit in the Battle of Guadalcanal. She, she, she got hit in the stern. She got hit in the stern with a torpedo. We lost 11 men. And I wasn't on her, thank God. I know. Fate. That's what fate will be playing parts in your life, too. Where you're, if either you're here or you're there. Fate will play a part in your life. Don't get in cars with some idiot that's drinking beer. and Then you won't get hurt. It's all part of life. I've lived to be 77 years old. I have five children, four boys and a girl. And I have two beautiful grandchildren. And that's what I, uh, I'd like to see you guys grow up and go through that. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, after, after, uh, the sh after we knew that the blue wasn't coming back, I got put onto the USS Dixie. That's, that's, this, that's this ship right here. Uh, she was. She was. What she did. She repaired. She repaired destroyers and other ships, cruisers that were damaged because she had all the. She had her machine shops and carpenter shops and and uh, all this type of equipment that could repair ships. You know. So that's uh, that's what I did on that. I, and uh, 1943, I went into Sydney, Australia, on that on that ship. And. Uh, we had, ten, we had 10 days, and I, that was for um, recreation. They sent us to Sydney for 10 days to a little recreation, go ashore, dance, have a couple of beers. <laughs> Mr. Ross, I want to ask you a couple of questions. We only have a few minutes left. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm sure a lot of the students are wondering, too, uh, when we dropped the atomic bombs, from yeah. the Japanese. Yeah. We dropped one on August 6th on uh, Hiroshima. Right. Truman told them that we had a new and powerful weapon, but there was no reply from the Japanese High Command, so it was used. Yeah. And three days later, still no reply from the Japanese High Command, warning again, mm -hmm. and the second one was used. Yeah. And uh, especially around the 50th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, a lot of people you know, came on the news and said, well, that was the wrong thing to do. Um, I'm kind of wondering you, as a veteran, having lived through, you know, Pearl Harbor and the entire Pacific War, being there for the surrender and all, you know, what do you think about um, the fact that we had to use the atomic bomb? Do you think that we had to use it? Do you think President Truman was wrong? What do you think? Well, no. I, I mean, uh, we had to use it because uh, the Japanese were vicious, vicious enemy. They were a vicious enemy. If they got one of our pilots, they, they cut his head off. They, and, and look what they did on the Bataan death march, how they starved our soldiers, starved them to death. And if one of them, if one of them dropped because of, from fatigue, they'd shoot him in the head. What are you, what are you gonna do with an enemy like that? Does anybody, does anybody know? I was off the coast of Japan when both those atomic bombs were dropped. I was on the Chicago heavy cruiser at that time. I didn't get that far with you, which you know takes time for all that. And uh, I went in. I went in with the occupation force, you know, into, into Japan. I saw the Japanese people. They wouldn't even come out of their houses for fear that we we were going to molest them. They were told. By the yeah, high command, they were, they were told, yeah. and if the U.S. soldiers managed to land on their homeland, their women would be raped, their children would be killed, and uh, they were told to resist at all costs. But of course, that's not the way it was. No, because we're because we're not we're not that type of people. Uh, Americans are not that type. You know, they have compassion for other people. Uh, the Japanese, they didn't have any compassion. Hitler didn't have any compassion. Look at look at the millions of people that he had murdered under his command. Uh, 
these people are going to keep popping up. And, you know, uh, you read the papers, you, you read the papers, you can see, you know, uh, what's going on in the world. So you think it's important that we study this time period? Yes. That's a stupid question, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think, you know, you, uh, I was 19 years old right out of high school. I'm just, I was just like you, you kids. I was, I played football, baseball, basketball, track. I was a hurdler. I was a pole vaulter. I broke the, I broke the uh, county record in Granville, 1939, in pole vault. I was a captain of a football team that was undefeated, unscored, and untied in 1939. Look at the, if you don't believe me, check back in the books. I was a, this guy. It's my best friend, I can. Well, I don't know why I do this. I do break down. I'm sorry. But uh, it's okay, Mr. Rob. When you have friends, when you have friends that are, you know, are not with you, you know, it's kind of hard. Yeah. I guess I'm probably too sensitive. I'm like that too. But I'm tough, dude. I'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 77 years old. I, but this guy was, Hackett Conley's his name. He was my best friend. We were co cat of that football team. You ready? Okay, you guys, I want to ask you a favor. I only have a couple of seconds. But if you would, if you know someone who was in World War II or a relative who perhaps passed away as Mr. Ross's friend has, I still would like you, if you want to, to fill out just one of these little interview forms. You don't have to do it yourself, even if you give it to the person and have them write and answer the question. If you can get it to me by next week, I would love you and I'll make your life worth living. So if you're one of those people, I'll leave it here and uh, thank you, Mr. Ross. Those are those are uh, he says those are Japanese planes. He headed for the engine room because that's where he that was where his job was, and I I started to help take down an awning which was back in the, in the, when we were in in the port in port we had an awning back here so we used to sit under that and read the Sunday papers and different things. So, but it was over that, it was over that number four gun. So we had to get, we wanted to get the gun ready to fire. So we had to take, I was helping take that awning down. And pretty soon the, the chief gunner's mate, he came, he came along and he, he had, he wanted me down in the magazine so that I could send, so that I could send the powder and ammunition up to uh, this, this gun right here. So I was, I was down in, in the magazine right down in here feeding uh, shells and powder to this gun. And all, you know, all through this time, we're trying to get the ship started. We start to move, you know, which we're, the, the, the engineers are working and uh, everybody's trying to do their job. And uh, we had, uh, as, I, as I told the other class, <clears throat> in, in, in peacetime, or, or in peacetime, they, they allowed two thirds of the ship to go ashore. So two thirds of the crew were over in Honolulu, which they could stay overnight, or or else they could, uh, you know, come back at 10 o'clock. Some had overnight liberty, some didn't. But our, we had a skeleton crew on Sunday morning. We didn't have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the crew there, so we had to make do with what we had, and that it wasn't easy because my my battle station was up on that searchlight, but there was no need for being on a searchlight at 8 o'clock in the morning. So the, so the chief gunner's mate asked me to go down into this magazine and push shells up. In the meantime, we're, you know, they're trying to get the, the they're trying to get the boilers going. And the, of course the Japanese concentrated on the battleships. You know, the, well, the Arizona, the uh, California, Oklahoma, the West Virginia, these are all battleships. Does anybody know have any idea what a battleship is? Or? 
Do, do, did anybody ever watch the History Channel? Does anybody watch the History Channel? Yeah. You watch it? Well, you see a lot of nerds watch it. You see a lot of destruction, right? You see a lot of you see a lot of uh, people being murdered by war, right? But anyway, uh, but anyway, uh, we were able to get out the harbor, and uh, and uh, we we joined with uh, two or three other ships out there that, that were lucky enough to get out along with us. And we went looking for the Japanese fleet that, that brought these planes and in there. The Japanese brought six aircraft carriers, four battleships, uh, five, five, about five or six cruisers, and about a, a dozen uh, destroyers came from Japan onto, onto the Hawaiian Islands, right? And they, the, there was about 300, 300 planes that, were, that were attacking the fleet. As I said to the other class, if you can imagine sitting here, not knowing that the ja a Japanese fleet was 200 miles offshore, and 300 planes started blowing Hudson Falls apart, if you can imagine, you know what that what that would be like. You know, uh, you, you have a, you know, you have these men. Uh, they're relaxing on a Sunday morning, and they're down they're down in their sleeping quarters. Some of them are, are taking a nap, and some of them are having breakfast. And you've got if you've got Japanese uh, putting these torpedoes into the side of the, these ships. If you can imagine them scrambling, trying to get out, trying to trying to get topside or whatever. What would they lose? I guess they lost close to 2,000 men throughout the whole, you know, all the ships that were hit. So it was, it was a pretty, pretty devastating thing, you know. And uh, does anybody know why, why the Japanese attacked us in the first place? Uh, somebody have, uh, somebody, do you have any idea why the Japanese attacked the, our fleet? Well, what's that? To try to prevent the, um, try to block the, um, entrance. Yeah, to the ocean from the bay. As far as their objective goes, I, I told them that the Japanese wanted to sink a few of the ships so that the rest of the fleet would have difficulty getting out. Yeah. But I yeah. think Mr. Ross is wondering, uh, why the Japanese wanted to hit us in the first place? They, wanted they knew we were going to join into the war. They wanted the first punch because they knew we were going to get in anyways. Yeah, but uh, what what possessed them to go, to uh, go through with such an attack? Uh, well, uh, they were. Now let's say the, the, the Japanese military were striking China, Manchuria, Borneo, Malaysia, right? Control of the Pacific. Right, right. It's, it's what, it, what, it, what it boils down to is greed, greed, you know, taking over these other countries because they were stronger than them. And they wanted they wanted all their all their resources, their natural resources, oil, whatever they could get to feed their military machine, right? And we were gonna put sanctions on them. We were gonna, you know, we were gonna, we were gonna stop them from from getting oil or, or even giving them oil. So they decided, well, hey, if they're gonna do, if the United States is gonna do this to us, we're gonna, we're gonna stop them from doing it. Now that, that's why they attacked at Pearl Harbor. We, uh, and the sad part of it is that <clears throat> there were there was negotiations going on in Washington, but our. our through the, I don't know who, who was to blame, the president uh, or who, uh, Kimmel, and there was a the military, the military, and our military, our military in Pearl Harbor. You had Admiral Kimmel, he was in charge of the Navy, and, and you had General Short. <coughs> you know, we were getting uh, submarine contacts. There was there were some Jack Tamara, like me. I was I was 19 years old out of high school when I went to the Navy. And uh, those pilots, those pilots were 20 years old, 21, 22 year old out of Annapolis, or, and, uh, or 
you know, they were Annapolis or West Point. Thank God for these educated officers because, you know, they, they had to train, they had to train. They were taught at West Point and they were taught at Annapolis how to be good fighting men. And, and they, they did it well. So anyway, uh, can I uh, yeah, you can just interject? Uh, yeah, sure. As I pointed out to you, uh, we wanted to get closer to Japan because from there, as Mr. Ross indicated, we could launch airstrikes and uh, didn't have to rely on the aircraft carriers anymore. Right. But, <clears throat> and the Japanese, they, they knew that was the plan and they just wouldn't surrender. They were fanatical fighters. Um, you remember the samurai and they were willing to commit suicide before they'd be captured in the kamikaze pilots, etc. Um, so I'd like to ask Mr. Ross a couple questions towards the end of the war. As it was clear that the United States was going to win, <coughs> Japanese high command made it clear to the Japanese people that they would not surrender that if the Americans did land on Japanese soil, uh, their women would be raped, their children would be killed, and uh, the Americans were going to treat them very, very badly. So they were conditioned from the from the outset never to surrender, never to give up, and this is what they were told. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Ross, you know, about the last few days of the war, last couple of months, we had a new president, President Truman. Truman was the one who obviously had to decide whether or not to use atomic force, the atom bomb, against uh, civilian populations against the Japanese people. He chose in the end, obviously, to do it. The Japanese were warned, but there was no answer from the Japanese high command. So on August 6, 1945, the first bomb was dropped in the city of Hiroshima. Um, and still no reply from the Japanese high command. So the second bomb was dropped on the 9th. On the 12th, I have a little pin here. It says BJ Day. On the 12th, the Japanese uh, indicated that they would surrender. And uh, you said to the earlier class that uh, you were on the Chicago at that time? I was, I, uh, uh, to fill you in a little bit quicker there, uh, when, uh, I, I was put on this ship here after my destroyer was sunk. And I put two years on her. Uh, and, and what we did, we followed, we followed up the fighting force and repaired their ships if they had any repairs to, to be made. And then, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Guadalcanal by this time. This is, this is 1944. This is not when the Japanese and the Americans were fighting. This is a little while after that. And uh, I, I had been out there since, uh, since, I, since I left home, uh, since boot camp. I had been out in the Pacific. So I, uh, uh, I, I, little, I was getting a little tired of seeing people that uh, came out after I did go home for, you know, for 20 or 30 days leave. So uh, I said I said to this uh, chaplain on the ship, I said, look, I've been out here since since boot camp, which was, which was in 1940. Now I've been out there for over three years in the war zone. And people that with less time than me have gone, were able, were sent back. But he said, I'll check your records. And he checked my records and he saw that I was telling the truth. Uh, I left Guadalcanal uh, in 1944, and I came back to Whitehall. I, I landed in San Francisco and came back to Whitehall for for uh, 20 days at home. You know, but I could tw after. 20. So anyway, uh, when I when I uh, finished that 20 days in Whitehall, and I like went with my you know my mother and my father and my sisters and my brothers and my friends, I enjoyed a good time with them. I went back to San Francisco to see where I was going to go next. And uh, when I got back to San Francisco, they, they said to me, USS Chicago, Philadelphia Navy Yard. Here I just came from New York. And I, I go back to San Francisco. And that, so now I got, I'm going by, I'm going by rail. I, you know, I'm going cross country by a train. So here I, I come over from, uh, when I first come back, I came from San Francisco back to New York by train. I had my 20-day, get on a train, and go back to San Francisco. 
get up down to San Francisco and a guy tells me, you've got to go back to Philadelphia. So I got to, three times in one month I went across country by train. I, I finally got a little break. But anyway, that assignment was to put the USS Chicago in commission in Philadelphia, which was a heavy cruiser. And I did that. We went back. To, after we got her commission, we went down through the Panama Canal and back over to, to Japan. And we were bombarding the coast of Japan. Uh, with the, uh, uh, we were bombarding the coast of Japan with the rest of the fleet. And I was, we were off the coast with both atomic bombs were dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. That is when the Japanese surrendered. Well, somebody said, well, wasn't that a terrible thing, dropping those atomic bombs on those Japanese people? Well, we were forced to drop. We were forced to drop the, the atomic bomb because the Japanese was a vicious enemy. They, uh, uh, they, were, they, murdered, they murdered our soldiers and sailors and our airmen and thought nothing of them. So what would you, you know, if we had to, if we had to land a, a force on the coast of, of Japan, how many men would it have cost us, you know, to take those islands by, by, by landing, you know, without dropping in the atomic bomb? So Truman made the choice to drop the atomic bomb, which is the only thing he could do. It was a horrible thing. It was a horrible thing, but it was the only thing we could do. It's either, it's either save yourself or save the Japanese uh, people, you know. But they, the Japanese warlords were stubborn. They were not going to surrender. In the end, I think it probably saved lives on their yeah, part, too. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. They didn't oh, yeah, and they part. saved lives of Japanese people, too. It's an awful thing to, to say, you know, when you kill 100,000 people with an atomic bomb, can you imagine 100,000 people? That's horrible. But the Japanese, the warlords were, were to blame for it. They would not surrender. So Truman says, if you don't surrender, i got to drop the bomb. And he dropped it. And he told them after the first one. If you don't surrender, we're going to drop the second one. Never, they would not surrender. But they surrendered after that second one because they knew that there would be no more Japan if they didn't. Well, Mr. Ross, we're just about out of time. I just like to uh, tell the children that I have sheets that I'd like them to pick up if they know a relative or even someone who's passed away.